Okay, so here we are, module six. We're moved into case study six. Um, this entire unit has to do with immunity. And so uh, obviously uh, COVID, I think, is a good, good place to start when it comes to uh, discussing how to apply some of this knowledge to the uh, current situation. So, um, so anyway, this, this particular case study um, was written sort of near the beginnings of COVID, I would say maybe mid to late 2020. So we know a few more, we have a, a little better knowledge of what's going on, but at the same time, this still applies and it's still very much what we would would deal with and not just with covid we'll we'll see other potential uh ways to identify viral infections so anyway uh that's a little bit of the kind of the background before we get going Pandem pandemic pandemonium why can't we just treat covid-19 and of course you know nowadays we we've, we've certainly gotten a little bit better but like i said it's a couple of years it's toward the beginning you could certainly recall what life was like back then. Um, and it's certainly still going around. Um, but anyhow, uh, but I want to go out with my friends. This is so unfair. So we've got uh, somebody, a uh, 16 year old, uh, she wants to go out, but she, she's, uh, uh, mom says you're not allowed to because uh, one of my coworkers tested positive for COVID 19. So ag again, you know, at the beginning, the, if if you were exposed in any way, we wanted you to quarantine and your family to quarantine for 14 days. Uh, again, not quite as dramatic today, uh, but at the same time, when we do get a viral infection, it's not a bad idea to uh, just take a little time off and, and, and rest a little bit. So anyway, I only spent two hours in mom's office, et cetera, and so forth. She wants to know all about the disease. Uh, never heard of COVID-19, uh, much less about getting it. So uh, the beginning is has a couple of links there. And then it asks, what are the symptoms of COVID-19? Um, fever, of course, shortness of breath, coughing, sore throat, um, general respiratory issues. Um, some folks, of course, at the beginning talked about losing their sense of taste or their sense of smell. Um, so those are potential, uh, symptoms as well, but, uh, generally, you know, it's a respiratory virus, so it's a SARS, uh, virus. So it's gonna, um, it's gonna attack the, the respiratory system. Now, whether that's the upper respiratory tract, lower respiratory tract, uh, depends on on the severity or the individual. Usually with COVID, we see more problems with the, the lower respiratory tract, uh, particularly the lungs, of course. So it says, what are the mechanisms of transmission for number two uh, for SARS uh, COVID uh, two? Um, of course, we know that it spreads from one person to another, generally when they're in close contact. Um, the person who's infected typically is going to spread the disease by shedding uh, the viral uh, chunks, if you will, that are connected to respiratory droplets. Usually these are certainly expelled through coughing or sneezing. So generally, again, we would see um, the, the viral shedding uh, attached to the respiratory droplets of the infected uh, individual. Um, and if an uninfected individual inhales uh, or touches and then uh, and then touches their their face or the nasal cavities, uh, any real mucosal membrane uh, of the respiratory tract, certainly that could lead to an infection of COVID. Now, you know, as with any any virus, uh, any bacteria, um, you know, these are opportunistic uh, invaders. So they are looking for an opportunity. Generally, you know, we went through this, the covering the the, ma uh, the mouth with masks uh, and the nose, uh, washing our hands, sanitizing workspaces, uh, generally keeping social distance. Those are the big things at the beginning and really kind of apply today to some degree, maybe not so much as, as far as, you know, wearing a mask, but, uh, you know, when it comes to certainly social distancing and, and practicing good sanitizing, 
I don't think that's uh, something that we should leave behind just because COVID is, is under control. So, uh, and that held true before COVID, because as we know, really the prevention measures that we take to uh, uh, keep viruses at bay uh, generally involve being sanitary uh, as well as other items. So here's the remote in a bit. So um, let's see. Uh, let's see. So what is quarantine? What does that typically mean? Uh, how long? So number three um, certainly just wants us to, we, I think quarantine was a word that maybe only a handful, maybe military people heard of before COVID. Now it's a, a word that everybody knows. So um, I'm able to get these on, on there. I'm just not able to get this on there. And I want to get this on to the screen. I plugged this in here, but it didn't work. Um, it, it finds the document cam, but it just doesn't find, oh yeah, now we're talking, man, brother, I know what you're doing. Pull this baby over. Beautiful. Then I get it up. Oh, there it is. And then hit plus. Left. Damn, you're not good, brother. And then, square piece. That's it. Set. Beautiful. Thank you, buddy. Okay. So, so there we go. Very quick and easy. Heart, 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 yeah, no, no problem. So, all right. So, so anyhow, what is quarantine again? That's, uh, that's a word that, uh, that uh, we certainly are all well aware of at this point. It just basically is a period of time, you know, when you want to uh, avoid uh, everybody else, you want to be in isolation. Um, if you've potentially been exposed, certainly if you've been exposed, you want to uh, isolate length of isolation depends on the contagion or the disease or the pathogen. Um, so again, oftentimes the length of quarantine is going to reflect uh, the time between exposure and onset of symptoms. So you get exposed today, you, and you know, you were exposed today, you may not get symptoms for three to five days. You may get them immediately. Um, so anyway, you want to quarantine as soon as possible, uh, if possible. Um, and again, when, when COVID first came out, it was, it was a 14 day deal um, because COVID, the COVID virus has a two to 14 day incubation. So that's why the, the original 14 days was put out there now again um could be um could be longer could be shorter a lot of it depends on how immunocompromised uh the the individual may be all right uh let's see based on the information above do you think megan and cat are at risk of developing covid19 well this certainly is is probably somewhat subjective. I think, especially now, back then, uh, I think maybe it, it was a little bit more, uh, uh, of a, of a plan if you'd been potentially exposed. Um, so to ask if the girls were at risk based on the information above, um, I think probably, uh, because they were in close proximity to the mother's coworker for, I think it said for about an hour, um, they're young, uh, I mean, 16, they're probably stressed out like everybody else is at that age. So, um, they probably don't, doesn't say anything about underlying conditions. They could be in, in sports. They could be extremely healthy, not immunocompromised at all. So they may or may not even show symptoms. And that's the other thing about COVID is they could, uh, be infected with it, uh, but be asymptomatic. So, but anyway, do you think they're at risk of developing it from their experience at the office? Oh, oh sure. I would imagine they would be. Uh, they spent, like I say, about an hour in the office and, uh, you know, but again, it depends on, on their degree of sanitation and what they did about that. So, uh, and, how, and, you know, if they were a little bit sick or run down or stressed out, that certainly gives COVID an opportunity. So part two gets into a little bit of the structural aspect 
um, one of the CDC recommendations right away because we know it's a virus. This has been the recommendation to prevent viral spread before COVID was ever around, and that's uh, washing your hands with soap and hot water. Um, so it talks a little bit about that. We look at the pictures uh, of the coronavirus. Corona means crown. Um, and these crowns are, are basically uh, their little antigens on the surface. And these antigens are what connect or communicate with other cells. So that's how our self cells know, like these little spikes, they're called. Again, they're membrane proteins, they're, um, they're antigens. When these little antigens connect to our uh, self cells, um, our self cells recognize this as being some sort of uh, invasive body or foreign body. And then uh, we are going to release some sort of immune response. Uh, and a lot of times that congestion and swelling and the fever that come with being infected by a virus, that, that's a typical immune response. Uh, certainly viruses uh, have a very uh, specific temperature that they uh, operate at. And so in 98.6, uh, well, there's a range, but say 96 to, to 100 is a range that COVID can survive. Once the, the internal body temperature gets above 100, it's certainly possible uh, that uh, the uh, virus can't survive uh, and function as well under that extreme heat. So that's one of the body's responses to an infection. We call that pyrogenic response. Of course, pyro means fire, generate me, genic means to generate. So basically generating a fever is a, is a typical body response uh, to a viral infection. A uh, bigger family. So SARS COVID-2 belong to a bigger family called the SARS associated coronavirus, a core containing nucleic acid and several associated proteins. Unlike other typical viruses, SARS-associated coronavirus has characteristics that make it slightly different. It's First off, it's an RNA virus, so it has nucleic acid center made of RNA, not DNA. So in order to replicate, it certainly has to rely on our cells has a protein associated with the RNA called a nucleocapsid protein. Capsid means small capsule. So it has a little tiny capsid uh, that's made of protein. And there's an outer phospholipid bilayer, just like we have around our cells. Um, and it has these different glycoproteins, these uh, imps or integral membrane proteins embedded in there. And again, when we see glyco anywhere in, in science, we definitely are thinking of sugars. So this glycoprotein is, and anyway, when we see sugar, we think energy is needed. So, um, so with glycoproteins, uh, this virus can, uh, can essentially uh, have an energy su uh, supply to do what it needs to do. And it has other accessory proteins as well. Uh, used by the virus that help with infection, uh, its own infection and replication. So, uh, our own ability to infect. All right, it has a phospholipid membrane. Ah, that's why I need to use soap to wash my hands to clean off this virus. Okay, so phospholipid, that implies that there's fat involved and, and soaps have detergent-like properties that'll break down that membrane. So, the, she starts thinking about that a little bit. So, the next batch of questions uh, asks us the structural differences between DNA and RNA. So, of course, um, the um, RNA is going to have a different nitrogenous base um, than DNA. With DNA, we see the four bases being A, C, G, and T, so adenine, cytosine, guanine, and tyrosine. So we see A, C, G, and T. Now, the T gets replaced, and, and DNA is a double helix as well. RNA is just basically a chunk of DNA. So RNA is a chunk of DNA, okay? So you're not going to see a double helix. Uh, RNA is what's used to replicate specific areas or, or regions 
uh, of whatever it is this the cell uh, is in need of. So in essence, DNA is kind of like a, um, a, a cookbook, if you will, and the RNA are the specific recipes within that cookbook. So when we need to replicate uh, a recipe from the cookbook, we don't make a copy of the entire cookbook, the DNA, we just make a photocopy of the specific recipe out of that cookbook. So that would be the RNA. All right, so it's still going to have some similarities. Now, uh, let's see. So anyway, the T is replaced. So when we get binding, uh, the A's, the C's, and the G's uh, are still going to be available as the nucleotides. But the U, the uracil, is the nitrogenous base that's present in RNA. So anyway, um, so when we encode... Uh, for whatever the protein is, the RNA is going to have most of those functions to, again, replicate whatever recipe it is or whatever structure it is or whatever enzyme it is that the cell is, um, uh, is in need of. So anyway, structural uh, differences, A, C, G, uh, and T for DNA, and then A, C, G, and U for RNA. And again, DNA is the genetic material that encodes for proteins as well as RNA. So again, the DNA is the, the, the ultimate in, in possessing the information. Uh, and then the RNA are going to be chunks or copies of portions of the DNA. So one human, in, so number two, list one human infecting virus that has a DNA-based genome. So um, wants to know what viruses are DNA based as opposed to RNA based. So we would think of uh, smallpox. Um, herpes is a is a very common virus. Uh, HPV. Uh, those are some big ones. HIV. Let's see. Let's look that up. It's not going to work on there. So HIV is a lot like COVID, so it's RNA based. Yep. Yeah, they have a lot of similarities, and you you possess it uh, potentially, or you can have that long COVID uh, as well. All right, so smallpox, herpes, uh, PAP, HPV, any uh, glandular virus, they call them adenoviruses. Um, number three is what a glycoprotein is. Um, again, it's glyco always means sugar. So uh, these are proteins that have some sort of carbohydrate chain or glyco chain attached. Okay, so you, usually we see what's called a polypeptide, which is just peptide is a fancy name for protein. Polypeptide just means we've got a large chain protein. Usually it's some sort of structure that's going to be attached to the membrane of a cell, and it's going to have a little carbohydrate chain attached to it. And that's going to help out, uh, again, with uh, different cellular processes for communication uh, basically allows the cell to communicate with the outside cell world. So um, cell communication, cell attachment. So the glycoprotein can help, uh, the, that carbohydrate chain can help with attaching uh, to other cells, um, protection, uh, identification. So basically it's kind of like a, a you know, a guard dog in a way uh, that, that hangs out outside of the cell. It's still attached to the cell membrane, but it is uh, one of the first kind of lines of defense if a virus has actually made it past the first line of defense, which is going to be the mucous membrane. So, you know, when we talk about viruses, we talk of in the immune system, we talk about lines of defense. And that first line of defense, of course, is the skin and the mucous membranes. So once the virus breaches those areas, then we get into problems with uh, interstitial regions. So, you know, once we the virus gets inside of the bloodstream, 
can travel to different areas of the body, at that point, we're potentially going to be dealing with uh, issues uh, inside of the extracellular space, where again, we'd find those glycoproteins available, uh, again, on the surface of cells. So they're going to be able to communicate, recognize, investigate, maybe uh, identify what uh, is floating around outside of the cell in that extracellular space or that interstitial region. So that's a, the kind of long and short of what glycoproteins are. Uh, Four asked to hypothesize as to why coronaviruses have glycoproteins in their membranes. What may be the purpose and function of these structures? Well, again, kind of going back to the previous question, you know, our own, why do our own cells have glycoproteins? Well, again, for communication, uh, for identification. So part of a viral, uh, I guess, MO or kind of their, their plan is, uh, you know, they're, they're, what we say is on the verge of life. So they're looking to find some way to become fully alive while still being able, and in order to be alive, they have to, uh, in essence, become one with you and your cells. But at the same time, they need to keep you alive so they don't want to damage or destroy you too terribly much. Because if you die from their infection, then they're no longer alive either. So the idea for a virus is to, to basically hide and mimic and mask itself to look a lot like self cells. So uh, therefore our immune system is basically what a virus it has to do. It has to breach your cell membranes. So if your cell membranes allow the virus in to the cell, at that point uh, we have serious problems. And typically we're gonna have the five alarm fire going on and, and a lot of, of uh, pyrogenic responses there's definitely uh, a lot of bells and sirens going off once the virus has breached any of your specific cell membranes. So for, for this COVID, the cell membranes are going to be in the respiratory tract. So again, if that virus breaches the cell membrane and gets inside of your cells, that's when it starts doing its damage. Now, um, with an RNA-based uh, virus, they can kind of mask themselves with glycoprotein markers uh, that, again, are going to help with uh, uh, binding and, and fusing with your cells. So it's basically uh, the, the COVID virus or coronaviruses have these glycoproteins in their membranes so they can connect with your cells, glycoproteins, and become joined as one. What that will do is enable the viral uh, cell to uh, release its capsids into your cells. So once the membranes of your cells fuse with the membranes of the cells of a virus, at that point, the virus can inject or release uh, uh, whatever it needs to uh, into your cells. All right. So anyway, that's why they have glycoproteins to communicate with your cells so they can fuse. Uh, phospholipid and phospholipid bilayer. This goes back all the way to the first couple of weeks of general AMP. We talked about uh, the phospholipid having a polar head group that has the phosphate. So the polar group is the phosphate, and that's going to be attached to a fatty uh, called a glycerol, and those are going to be the nonpolar uh, aspects. Those are uh, uh, fatty acid tails, if you will. So the tails of the phospholipid bilayer are going to be, um, let's see if I can pull up. Phospholipid bilayer. And again, you've seen this a, a zillion times, but just as a reminder, again, you're going to have these phosphate heads, and these are going to be hydrophilic. So the surface of the cell, this would be the outside of the cell, that is going to be full of water primarily. So these phosphate heads have to be hydrophilic, meaning they like water. Then we go to the bottom phosphate heads, 
they also have to be uh, uh, hydrophilic or lovers of water because the inside of the cell has a high concentration of water. So it's this in-between layer. This is where we find those fatty acid tails and some glycerol. This is going to be where we would find uh, the lipid portion. This would be uh, hydrophobic. So in order for water or anything to pass through the cell membrane into a cell, we have to have some sort of channels uh, involved. Okay, so that's the basic structure of the phospholipid and the phospholipid bilayer. Okay. Again, the polar, if it's polarized, then it can work with water. Nonpolar means we're gonna have issues with water. It's gonna be hydrophobic. That's gonna always be related to fat or lipids. So soap, what soap is going to do, so how is soap going to do anything? Again, um, because the soap molecules uh, are going to be able to go after the hydro, uh, those hydrophobic molecules, they're going to break down that, uh, those fatty acids or those tails of the membrane of the, uh, of the uh, virus, of the coronavirus. Because again, the coronavirus has its own phospholipid bilayer. So lipid means fat. Soap is a detergent that breaks down fat. So that's how soap is going to have its action. It's going to help to break apart that membrane of the uh, COVID virus. And the, the RNA and the nucleoid proteins inside of the cell of the virus, they can't survive without that protective phospholipid bilayer. So again, soap uh, is gonna destroy and break down those lipids. That's part two. Part three, how does, uh, how does the infection occur? Um, so recognize, so this is fascinating. Um, step one, and, and again, a, a lot of your RNA viruses are going to behave in, in a similar fashion. So step one, uh, COVID is going to be recognized and attached to the host cells via those glycoproteins. So everything we've talked about kind of leading up to this point has involved the phospholipid bilayers of our cells and the cells of the virus and the presence of those glycoproteins that exist on the surface of both of the cell membranes, our cell membranes, the self membranes, and the non-self cell membranes or the, the viral membranes. Okay, so those phospholipid bilayers have the glycoproteins uh, and they're going to recognize and attach the host cell. Step two is the, uh, the host cell or our self cell is gonna then uh, engulf uh, that, um, uh, that virus. Okay. So COVID-2 gets engulfed uh, and swallowed up by the host cell. And at that point, the RNA of that infecting uh, COVID cell gets released, but it's uh, going to remain in the cytoplasm of your cell. So there's a little capsid uh, that's going to contain uh, the, the uh, RNA of the virus. And it basically uh, connects to the membrane of your cells and then injects that capsid with RNA in it. Okay. And so then your cell, the self, the self cell, the host cell is going to translate uh, that RNA and make RNA dependent polymerase. And that polymerase is going to help to break down and continue the, the manufacture of photocopies of the RNA that's gonna get packaged into new vi virions or small viruses. And then it's gonna transcribe or make more photocopies. So when we see the word transcribe, that means photocopies. Specific sections of messenger RNA as, trans as templates to translate, which is what all the ribosomes in the cells are doing from the original infecting uh, RNA. So basically what goes on is uh, the COVID virus injects a little capsule of its own RNA 
into uh, the cytoplasm of your self cells. And again, we're talking about the respiratory cells of the body. These could be those uh, pseudo, uh, those goblet cells uh, that we find within the respiratory tract. Okay. So anyhow, uh, let's see, to be packaged. So in the RNA of the virus gets injected uh, our cells recognize it as a uh, potentially harmless or it's even part of the self. Uh, so uh, we're going to start making photocopies uh, of that uh, viral RNA. And then uh, our own messenger RNA is going to use those photocopies as what it assumes are okay templates for translating and producing more of this viral RNA. So now step six, we get to the newly synthesized coronavirus viral M messenger RNA. And again, that's going to get translated into viral protein. So we made a bunch of photocopies of recipes that uh, aren't ours. They're poisonous. Um, and again, usually our immune system is going to recognize uh, these, uh, these non-self cells as being foreign, and we're going to have to uh, get rid of them. But the tricky part of COVID is that the RNA that COVID was providing was not recognized as being a problem by our own cells. And so our own cells allowed that uh, COVID RNA to overtake uh, the system. And uh, But, you know, after you've been exposed to it, you now have a body system that recognizes uh, these these uh, viral RNA strands as being foreign as opposed to being uh, self cells. So anyway, a, a viral infection is almost like an autoimmune deal because viruses, remember, they're trying to mask some mask themselves to look like uh, self cells. So anyway, Many of the newly synthesized viral proteins are processed for packaging and partially complete virions are assembled and then they bud off from the host taking with them the host membrane. So the, describe the steps of a lytic infection. So uh, lytic means lysing. So um, basically we just did those steps. So step one is the virus being recognized and taken in by the host. That's a lytic infection, lysing, means engulfing and bringing it in. Um, and then again, the viral DNA gets released, moves into the nucleus. The viral DNA is incorporated into the host's DNA. And then the messenger RNA of the virus gets incorporated into, into the host's DNA. So again, the, the goal of the viral RNA is to get past the cell membrane, get into the cytoplasm, and then go past that and get into the nucleus of the cell because that's where, uh, again, uh, where we do uh, our transcribing or our making of the photocopies. So when, we, when a, a virus can only affect us generally if it makes it all the way uh, to, to the uh, nucleus. And again, this is a DNA infection. We're dealing with an RNA inf infection. Okay? So with a typical DNA infection like herpes, the, again, we're going to see that virus go all the way into uh, the cytoplasm and then past uh, the nuclear membrane and into the nucleus. So that's generally what we see with a DNA viral infection. So again, the DNA of a healthy cell is going to be in the nucleus when uh, when we need some sort of basic protein produced, we get uh, some sort of uh, transcribing or photocopying made inside the nucleus. And then we send that photocopy out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm for the messenger RNA to work with ribosomes to kind of string that item together. So if we have a virus that's DNA-based, its goal is going to be to get to the nucleus. Okay, so that's the difference. Um, okay, so how are the steps of uh, SARS-CoV-2 different from the lytic infection of a DNA virus? How are they similar? Well, again, we just went through the differences 
the the uh, an RNA virus just has to breach the cell membrane and get into the cytoplasm. Okay, so the RNA virus never leaves the cell cytoplasm. So, so I have a cell, so the cell membrane um, is going to protect us from a viral infection. With an RNA virus, it just has to get past the cell membrane and into the cytoplasm. With a DNA virus, it has to get past the cell membrane, then into the cytoplasm, then it has to go through the nucleus. So a DNA virus has to get into the nucleus. COVID being an RNA virus is basically just goes into the to the cytoplasm and then it's it's ready to go at that point the our body provides it with the materials that it needs from that point so uh let's see so how are the steps so again with with a an rna virus like covid we just need to get into the cytoplasm um it remains there and and gets replicated to make more rna uh, as well as replicating to make messenger RNA for this translation. So again, the basics of DNA, it's so okay, study five talks about that. Again, the basics of DNA is that we uh, make photocopies or do transcription in the nucleus, and then we do translation, actually reading the recipe in the cytoplasm. So that's what the RNA virus does gets into the cytoplasm, uses its own RNA polymerase for RNA replication, but uses the host machinery. So uses your own, uses your own uh, uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum, uses your own ribosomes to actually go through the process of translation. Uh, DNA, again, we have to get, has to get to uh, into the nucleus. And from there, it uses the host's transcribing and translation machinery to create a new virus. So let's see. So how might that RNA-based genome result in an increased infection rate? So how would would that uh, how would we get an increased infection rate with RNA viruses? Again. Um, the the RNA viruses because they only have to get into the cytoplasm. They're just we have less defense against them. So um, the nucleus has its own membrane. The nucleus has its own immune system. Even so, it's much more difficult for a for a DNA virus to um, to really wreak very much havoc. It might give you problems for a short period of time but generally your body is going to destroy those new D, those new cells that are that were infected by that dna virus rna viruses again they're they're a lot uh more difficult for the body to to manage regarding the immunity aspects because again um, they they just have to do one step. They just have to to get uh, translation done in the cytoplasm, whereas a DNA virus has to go through the whole process of transcription and translation. So RNA skips that step and makes it a lot more difficult uh, and a higher uh, infection rate than a DNA viral infection. Uh, let's see. Number four, central dogma of, bi of biology. How does coronavirus defy traditional uh, models of central dogma? So again, it's basically everything we've been talking about regarding DNA. So the central dogma of biology discusses the fact that DNA gets replicated. We make more DNA. 
and DNA gets transcribed um, or photocopied into messenger RNA. Um, and then that process get, is called transcription in the cytoplasm and RNA gets translated into the protein that we need. So again, it's just like I said before, the nucleus is like the library full of cookbooks. And when we need a specific recipe from one of those cookbooks, we pull it off the shelf and we go through and we find the recipe and we make a photocopy. That's called uh, transcribing or transcription. All of that occurs in the nucleus. Once we leave the nucleus with that recipe, we it's called the messenger RNA. And then we deliver that message out into the cytoplasm of the cell. And then the messenger RNA works with uh, a polymerase, basically an enzyme that kind of breaks it down and allows a translation to occur or the reading of the recipe to occur. And then that gets translated into uh, pro some sort of protein at the level of the ribosomes. And again, we see this happen at the rough ER. Um, what COVID does and any of these RNA viruses, they just make more, they make RNA into more RNA, which gets translated into proteins. So we don't need a DNA template with these COVID, um, any of these RNA viruses, you don't need a DNA template. So that's how COVID and these RNA viruses defy central dogma is that they use our own, um, they use our own RNA to get taken care of what they need to, as well as their own. Okay, we don't need to fill out the table. Let me go over. Sure. Part three, fill in the table below. You don't need to fill in the table, and you don't need to do part five. All right, so we're on to part four. Um, so the, these these guys have stayed in quarantine for the last week. Everybody's getting a little restless, of course. Um, yeah, don't feel very good. Just so tired. Can't get enough air. I'm going inside. Running a fever. Became increasingly worse. I uh, couldn't keep the fever in check. Took her to the emergency room. Oh, she tested positive for COVID. So it took seven days or so to incubate. Uh, pleading with the doctors for some kind of help. Her, her parents become desperate. Isn't there something he can do to help uh, treat the virus? Uh, give her penicillin. Uh, sorry, but that's not going to work. Antibiotics like penicillin work on bacteria. Antivirals are pharmacological agents. We use to treat viral infections. Excellent. All right. So Kat's mom, ooh, she doesn't want to take no for an answer. Uh, so she asked nurses what kind of antivirals are available. She found the following list. Oseltamivir Oseltamivir is an antiviral. Uh, that's Tamiflu is what you, you've heard that, of that. Um, so that's going to treat influenza. That's a neuro neuraminidase inhibitor. So it's going to inhibit an, an enzyme uh, that has to do with a, a neuramin, a neuraminidase. A neura, oh, it's an amine uh, that is related to uh, the enzyme that helps to break down a specific issue that relates to the immunity uh, of, the, of uh, an influenza infection. A cyclovir is what they give you for uh, herpes. Uh, so that's going to stop replication of viral DNA. So herpes virus, that is a DNA virus. So that's probably not going to help. Uh, Raltegravir is an antiviral used to treat HIV. So that stops integration of HIV into the host genome. So that would have to affect uh, the cell membranes or, or the glycoproteins. Lamivudine is another HIV drug. Uh, reverse uh, transcriptase is the enzyme that copies HIV RNA into DNA. So this goes after a specific enzyme, uh, reverse transcriptase. And Maravarac uh, also treats HIV, blocks entry of the virus, 
into macrophages and T cells. One thing we know about HIV is it does go after the T cells and the macrophages, which are major immune system cell boosters. So if we can prevent HIV from entering a cell, then certainly that uh, would prevent it from uh, altering uh, our RNA of that specific cell. So let's see, what do we do in here? What's an antibiotic? And why won't an antibiotic be effective against treating COVID-19 or, or any virus for that matter? Again, we know antibiotics treat bacterial infections by killing or preventing replication of that specific bacteria. COVID-19 is a virus, so it's not going to respond to an antibiotic. So we have antivirals. And what are antiviral, what, when are antiviral treatments most effective? How do these uh, avoid harming the host? So antivirals treat viral infections, of course. They're most effective uh, early. So you would want to get, uh, if you were exposed to a virus, you'd want an antiviral administered very early in the progression. That way we could slow, uh, potentially slow the entry uh, of the virus into the host cells. Uh, let's see, what else does it do? Um, oh, well, how, d d d d d d d let's see, let me check my notes. Oh, it's slowing the progression of the viral infection allows your own immune system. So basically the antiviral is gonna slow everything down, thus hopefully allowing your own immune system to kick in. So number three asks for each of those antivirals that Kat's mom identified suggests a reason why they will not work for SARS-CoV-2. We kind of went through those, um, each one, but again, acyclovir is going to stop the replication of viral DNA. So that's not going to help us, right? Because we're dealing with an RNA virus. So let's move into the, some of these RNA viruses again. Um, they, they, they're more specific to the virus itself. So part of the treatment over these last few years of the research over these last few years to treat COVID was to find specific, uh, drugs or antivirals that would go after, uh, the COVID glycoproteins. So, um, number four is kind of your own, um, come up with your own kind of, after going through all of this coming up with your own ideas as to how maybe we could uh, prevent COVID uh, from entering into a cell and, and uh, getting involved with that life cycle that we, we don't necessarily want to occur. So generally speaking, you know, um, if you consider the life cycle of the COVID virus and what's unique to that virus, then you would you would possibly be able to to come up with some way to prevent it from ever even uh, attaching or linking to our cells. So you know these glycoprotein uh, markers, antigens on the surface of the COVID phospholipid bilayer, we would need to find a way to either destroy those or block those glycoproteins from connecting to our glycoproteins. If we don't get the meshing or the, the uh, merging of the virus with our cells, then it can never enter our cell membranes and enter, or enter past the cell membranes and enter the cell. So again, the idea really is, is that we, we, if we have breached, if not we, if COVID has breached the first line of defense, it made it through the mucous membranes. It made it into the bloodstream. It's now been delivered to uh, to the uh, goblet cells and the mucous cells of the respiratory system. What happens next? Well, what happens next is as glycoproteins want to attach to your glycoproteins, in essence, your membrane proteins and their membrane proteins want to combine and, and then basically open up we fuse membranes, thus allowing the inside of the viral cell to, to enter into the inside of our cells. So we have to prevent that from happening. And in general, today's medicines for COVID is going to be, uh, well, the, the vaccines were to provide your cells with the ability to recognize 
this latent or sleepy or hibernating slash dead COVID virus as, and then we would create some sort of barrier or some sort of, of uh, antiviral chemistry ourselves uh, to fight the COVID. Now, again, once you've been exposed to it and your body has started to create these different enzymes that attack COVID or go after its uh, uh, cell membranes or go after those glycoproteins, I mean, at that point, you know, your, your risk of, of reacquiring COVID and, and having uh, the degree of intense uh, symptoms goes down. So hopefully uh, that that's what that not hopefully that's really what we've been seeing over these last two and a half years or so. So anyway, that's what a, uh, an RNA virus is trying to do. Really, this piggybacks off of off of last week or case study five, going through all of the basics of DNA and and translation uh, or transcription and translation. Again, those basic questions oftentimes pop up on NCLEX or or even the the uh, uh, T's exam or or uh, the HESI exam. Uh, just if you do see a DNA question or an RNA question, it typically wants to know if you if you grasp where these two things happen. Uh, remember, we transcribe or write things down or make a photocopy in the nucleus. We translate it in the cytoplasm. So again, those are the those are the basics of DNA and RNA. So the DNA is stored in the nucleus. We need a photocopy of it. We make a photocopy, we piggyback it with messenger RNA and ship it out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. At that point, the uh, uh, messenger RNA has the recipe photocopy. It's then going to provide it to the ribosomes, and they're going to break that down and try to understand and translate what it is that the recipe says. So again, a DNA virus is going to alter the recipe. So the DNA virus gets all the way to the nucleus and says, oh yeah, make photocopies of this, but you're going to add two cups of, of sugar instead of one cup of sugar. And so then it makes a bunch of photocopies of that, sends that out to the cell. And then the RNA uh, or the ribosomes read that and translate that recipe as being something that it shouldn't be. And that's, that's a DNA virus. An RNA virus brings its own RNA and says, here we go. It's already been uh, uh, transcribed. Uh, we're ready for you to translate it. And, and so the body just says, okay, we'll translate it and, and we'll, we'll manufacture whatever it is you want. So again, we have to prevent that from happening uh, at the first line of defense by again, washing our hands, social distancing. If we're not feeling good, don't go out. If you are feeling crappy, you, you know, wear in your, you know, you cover your, your nose or mouth at the very least and prevent uh, being infected by others uh, or infecting other people. Again, uh, viral uh, infections, bacterial infections, they're opportunistic. So they're just looking for a host that has a compromised or suppressed immune system. So because of stress, because of dehydration, because of sleep, because of nutrients, all these factors deplete our immune system normally. So if that's where you're at, and then you go out in public and you get coughed on, or you touch a doorknob and you rub your nose, next thing you know, your immune system can't handle it. And you've now got an infection. So, so anyway, those are the basics. Most of us don't just get sick out of the blue. There are usually signs leading up to it. And usually those signs involve being worn out, worn down, tired, uh, dehydrated, stressed out, all those things. So if that's the case, take a couple of days off, take it easy, relax, and, and then get back to it. So anyway, that's it for this week for, for uh, case study six. Next week, we'll get into, we'll go a little deeper uh, with the respiratory system. So we'll look at a, a healthy functioning respiratory system. And then what happens if uh, we get some sort of puncture, uh, a very common occurrence in the emergency room, for sure, what we call a pneumothorax. So we'll look at that next week. Have a great night.